computer. Good. Okay. <laughs> we are recording also. Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah. Are we still here? Huh? It looks like nobody's left in the old chat. So then, with a few minutes of delay, I've been calling. It's my great pleasure to welcome Jim Atkins to this uh, keynote talk in 2020. Um, of course, I prepared uh, everything that I could find about Jim on the internet, uh, so, but uh, to make the story short, not, let me not get uh, too much into it. Um, <laughs> professor at Yale, he can't go to the office right now, so he has to cope with his uh, communication situation from wherever else. Um, but he was the chair for Foxy in 2005, for DCOS in 2007, served for the Human Development Committee, and also a recipient of the Prize for Teaching Excellence at Yale. His main research area is in distributed algorithms, and his work emphasizes the use of randomization to solve uh, difficult problems, especially in the field of distributed algorithms. Um, from his Wikipedia entry, I also learned that he authored Tiny Mud, which is one of the first social muds, which is a multi user dungeon or a multi user. Christian. Dungeon. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's almost impossible to hear you over the breathing sound. What should I do? Um, Jim, are you, I don't know if it's you uh, breathing. Maybe you could, oh, oh that's Jim, better. Okay, Jim was not muted, right? That's why. Okay, I can mute, uh, I'll mute Jim for the moment. Yeah. Until, and I'll, I'll mute him back, okay. Um, I just wanted to say at the end of my introduction session here, that uh, Wikipedia has dozens of entries on, um, on mods or multi-user dun dungeons, but nothing at all on uh, randomized consensus, which is one of his other uh, research topics. However, Wikipedia has an article on population protocols, uh, which is also the title of his talk. And so I'm handing over now to Jim for to the floor. Jim, please. Um, all right. So I suppose we need a coordination mechanism for what slide we're on. Uh, but this is not very interesting. So if we could move to the, the slide number two, population protocols motivation, I'll start talking about that. Good, we're here. So, okay. So again, you know, I apologize for all the confusion here. Uh, we got hit by a tropical storm on the east coast of the U.S., and so about half the power in Connecticut is out, and this seems to have affected the internet. But uh, today I'm going to be talking about a model which for the most part has no failures, so we can at least, uh, in theory, be living in a world where this sort of thing doesn't happen. All right, so the purpose of this talk is in substance to do both an overview of uh, the population protocol model, possibly for people who haven't necessarily worked with it before or looked at it too closely, but also talk about the history of the model and how it's evolved over time in response to various results that people have come up with about possibilities and impossibilities under certain assumptions in the model. And to start this process off, I want to talk about the original motivation that we claimed in the POTC 2004 paper for this model. This model is about 16 years old now, which was that we wanted to look at uh, simulating distributed systems that were made up of uh, weak anonymous agents that had very limited control over how they interacted with each other. So they had no ability to address other agents in the system, to send messages to specific other agents, even if the agents had names that would allow them to choose to communicate with a particular agent. Uh, the assumption was that which agents were allowed to communicate with each other at each point in time was something the agents had no control over. And the story that we told and the original paper was that this was motivated by sensor networks. So we imagined that you had a collection of, say, smart RFID tags that were attached to wandering animals of some sort. Uh, the picture I attempted to draw cows, I think, in the paper we talked about birds, or actually possibly Mike's uh, Posse 2004 talk, he talked about birds. And uh, the idea was that two agents could only communicate with each other if they were close up, since they couldn't control the animals that were wandering around uh, carrying them. They didn't have the ability to cause this to happen. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? This should be also population protocols motivation. Yes, we are now on slide two with the chemical uh, <laughs> Excellent, thank you. All right, so uh, this was this story was one of the first things that fell by the wayside, and, and this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this talk. 
that all the details they had on this first slide are going to slowly disappear one at a time as the model turned from the model that we described in 2004 to the one that we have now. So the revised motivation for this model, which is, is kind of the official uh, party doctrine these days, is that we're interested in molecular computation. And the nice thing about molecular computation is it actually justifies in a much better way than sensor networks the restrictions that we place on the agents in the system. So now the idea is that an agent is going to be a molecule and an interaction between two agents is going to be a reaction between two molecules. And what justifies the assumption that these things are all happening not under the control of the agents is that we assume that these interactions are happening, say, in a gas or a well-mixed test tube or something of that sort, where the agents, you know, as molecules, don't have control over where they're going and who they interact with. And the other thing that's nice about this revised uh, motivation for the model is it actually ties in very nicely to the extensive literature out there on molecular computation and computation and chemical reaction networks. So we can think of the population protocol model in this sense as a simplified version of standard chemical reaction networks, where the main simplification is that we assume that all of the reactions that are occurring are occurring at roughly a constant rate and the same rate for all the different interactions. And we assume that all the reactions are bimolecular and conservative. That is, they take two molecules in and have two molecules coming out. And there are variants of the model that will relax these assumptions as well. But for the core model, this is pretty much what we'll stick to. All right, next slide, please. Um, okay, so population protocols model, I think, yes. is, is what we're looking for here. Okay, so let me describe the model in a little bit more detail. It's a very simple model, so defining it isn't going to take terribly long. Uh, as I said, we have a collection of agents. These agents, we assume, for the moment, are finite state. And if we have an interaction between two of these agents, we're going to look at the previous states of both agents and update the states of both agents according to some transition uh, uh, function. And I can't actually point to things, but the, the thing in the middle of the two test tubes here is intended to be an example of a particular transition function. And in this case, this is implementing a very simple leader election protocol. So in our starting configuration depicted on the test tube on the left, everybody thinks that they're a leader. They're all red. And the protocol says that if two leaders meet each other, one of them is going to drop out and become a follower. That's the top line in the transition table. And there's some additional transitions that um, exist in this protocol, which appears in the Ponzi 2004 paper for somewhat historical reasons. We allow leaders and followers to swap places so that this will work even if we have a restriction on which agents can interact with which other agents. But the goal is that eventually all of the leaders are going to meet each other and will be left with a single leader as depicted in the test tube on the right there. Now, in order to determine who interacts with whom at each step, uh, we assume that there is an adversary that is in control of scheduling, as in most of these distributed computing protocols. And this adversary is going to be subject to a fairness condition, which uh, we use, just use a very simple global fairness condition that says that if there is some configuration out there, some global configuration out there that is continuously reachable throughout the protocol, eventually that configuration is reached. All right, so the adversary can delay interactions between particular agents for a very long time or delay certain transitions for a very long time. But if there is a way to get to some terminal configuration, eventually we will follow that path despite the interference of the adversary. All right, next slide, please. Slide five. So, yes, why finite state? Okay. One of the motivating ideas we had back when we wrote the paper was that we wanted to be very careful to restrict the model so that it didn't suddenly collapse into some existing model. And in particular, this is why we made the assumption that the agents were so weak, because we wanted to guarantee that the agents did not have ability to construct ident identities for themselves, or to use those identities as a way of doing addressing kind of through the back door by virtue of just being able to wait to meet a person with a particular identity that you wanted to talk to. And the reason we wanted to do this is we were terrified of the idea of ending up accidentally building a Turing machine. Not because Turing machines are bad, but because we figured that if we accidentally built a Turing machine, our model suddenly becomes much less interesting because we know more or less what Turing machines can do. 
All right, that's possibly a bit of an exaggeration about Turing machines, but uh, we didn't want our model to just suddenly turn into, well, you can program this if you program a Turing machine, so nothing happens. So we avoided that by making this very strong assumption on the uh, state space of the agents, restricting them to be finite state, which meant that they did not have enough space to remember anybody's identity, including their own. All right, next slide, please. Uh, however, this uh, didn't prevent us from doing some things. So in this model, you can still take advantage of the fact that you have many, many agents running around working in parallel to represent uh, more complicated states than what you can just contain in a single one. And we can build uh, quite a few protocols, mostly based out of the leader election protocol they already gave as an example. And so in this protocol, as I said, the candidates uh, drop out when they meet other candidates, and we have this global fairness condition. And if we look at the configuration space on the right, um, where we're looking at, in this case, all the possible configurations with three agents, the global fairness condition, which says that we eventually reach any reachable configuration that's continuously reachable, will eventually drive us into this strongly connected component on the far right there inside the oval, um, which is the uh, set of configurations that all have a single leader. And we're going to use this leader election protocol as the basis for building more complicated protocols that do actual computation. All right, next slide, please. Seven. All right, so an example of doing this is we can use this coalescence process that is implemented by leader election to compute, for example, parity. So in this picture, I've got three colors, I've got three states. So a blank state represents a non-leader that is no longer effectively participating in the protocol. And a leader state is either coded as being odd or even. So in this case, I started out all of my agents as having an odd input. Here we're calculating the parity of the population as a whole. But we could also start some of the agents as red or blue, and then we'd be calculating the parity of the number of red nodes in the initial population. And the trick here, which will work for any operation that is, is both commutative and associative, is that when we combine two values together, when we combine two leaders together into a single leader, we're also going to combine the values they're carrying by whatever operation it is that we're implementing. And this will maintain an invariant that the, the total of the values carried by all the leaders at that when we coalesce down to a single leader, when there's a single leader just carrying one value, that value is going to be equal to the sum of all of the values in the original input. And we can't actually detect when this occurs. There's no termination mechanism built into this protocol. And in fact, there can't be a termination mechanism built into this protocol because the agents in the population have no way of detecting whether or not they have, in fact, uh, met all of the other agents out there. Because we have an adversary doing the scheduling and because it's only required to eventually allow transitions to occur that may occur, we might easily get stuck in a state where some agent, for example, has never interacted with anybody at all for a very long time time, and it's only when that interaction finally happens with the appropriate agent that we finally collapse down to a single leader and get the correct value. And this is also typical of what we see in population protocols. Most of the population protocols out there do not perform any kind of terminating computation where we have a signal that the computation is fi has finished. The best that we can hope for is, is what we call stable computation, which is that we eventually converge to having the correct answer even on, either on a single leader possibly on all of the agencies turn out to be equivalent. And uh, once we have converged to this correct output configuration, we stay there forever, despite further uh, execution of the protocol. All right, next slide, please. Uh, slide eight. Okay, uh, eight, uh, is it the example majority slide? Yes, majority. Okay, so, um, another example of something we can do, which does not depend on this coalescence process, is majority. So here again, just describing these very simple examples we had in the original paper. We've got much more sophisticated protocol since then, which I'll talk about later. With majority, the easiest way to do it is just to do cancellation. If we want to know were there more blue nodes than red nodes in the initial population or vice versa, uh, we can do this with a single transition rule that just says that if a red node meets a blue node, they both drop out and become blank. And the nice thing about this is that 
we know because of the fairness condition that eventually all of the nodes that can cancel will cancel, and whoever's left behind is going to be showing us the majority value. All right, so there's so a little bit of nastiness that requires additional machinery if we want to actually be able to test for equality. But if we assume that there is a majority in the initial population, we're eventually going to have that majority value be the only color left among all of the agents. And if we want the output to be present in all of the agents, we can also do that by just adding some additional states that allow the, the blank agents to remember the color of the, the, color of the last non-blank agent that they encountered. All right, next slide, please. Yeah, more general assumptions. <laughs> Excellent. So it turns out that we can use this co and this majority cancellation idea and, and a few other fairly small tricks to compute a fairly wide variety of predicates on the counts of agents in the initial input. And so coalescence will get us parity and also any, again, commutative associative operation, including mod k for any fixed k. We can't do arbitrary k that is not fixed because we only have constant states. A cancellation gets us things like less than equality, and we can also implement addition by simply renaming uh, tokens so that we convert you know, A's and B's into C's. And if we want to do logical combinations of predicates that we can otherwise, we can do that by just build, running the pro, uh, protocols for those predicates in parallel, and then allowing each agent for itself to combine the results according to some logical formula involving, say, and or not operators and so forth. And if you put all of these things together, what this tells us is that we can stably compute any predicate that we can define in what's called first order Pressburg arithmetic, which is the first order theory of uh, the natural numbers with addition, which essentially just means all the things that we can do using these particular operations. All right, and I have an example of this on the slide, but it's not a very exciting example. Uh, next slide. Okay, so very slightly know. more exciting. Okay, yeah, semi linear predicates. For slightly more. Uh, Exciting example. Uh, this is a picture of, of a, a more complicated predicate that we've plotted here. Um, it turns out that the Pressburger uh, definable formulas, and this has been known for, for a very long time, we can also characterize these as what are called semi linear predicates, which are predicates that can be defined as the union of cones, where we have some base vector and then some set of vectors that we can add constants, you know, non fractional integer multiples of that to it. And so if you can build a representation of whatever it is that you want to compute that is in this form of a union of cone, population, then that's something that you can recognize using one of these stable computable population protocols. All right, next slide. Um, so, and, and one of the things that we noticed early on, or that uh, various people noticed early on, this was kind of part of the initial uh, uh, fluorescence of the population protocol uh, work, was that you could actually them up your predicates in a lot of different contexts. So making minor tweaks to the model didn't seem to affect too much what they could compute. So in the standard model, you could compute them. If you assume, for example, that your inputs uh, only converged after some initial period of confusion, kind of almost a self-stabilizing model, you could again compute semi-linear predicates on the ultimate values of the inputs. Um, One-way interactions, suitably defined, still where only one agent state to change state, still allow you to compute the semi-linear predicates, and even if you had a small number of agent failures, uh, which I think is the first and last time I'm going to be talking about failure in this talk, at least I hope so, as long as my phone holds out, um, you still got the semi-linear predicates with a slight tweak that uh, you have to have predicates that are robust against changing a few of the inputs because the in uh, failures might hide those inputs. And the bad news is that we discovered a few years after finding the original model and observing that we could do these semi-linear predicates that, in fact, you couldn't do anything else. All right, next slide, please. Okay, what so, yeah, what population protocols can't to do? So this was a, a result that uh, Dana Angla and uh, David Eisenstadt and I had in Ponzi 2006. And what we noticed was 
<laughs> we're trying to build population protocols, we kept running into the same problem, which was that we couldn't compose protocols, and in particular, we couldn't do nested loops because we had no ability to detect termination. So very natural things, like trying to do multiplication by repeated addition, turned out to be very hard uh, because we would be happily adding away on the, on the inside of loop, and then we'd walk Okay, I've now successfully collected all of the agents I want to add in. Let's start a new iteration of this loop and do the addition operation again. But I had no way of detecting that I had, in fact, successfully collected all the agents that I wanted to add together there. There was always the possibility, given this adversarial scheduling, that there was some agent that had still been left out. And if I went and proceeded with the next step of my multiplication operation, that agent might come back and cause errors either in the previous step or in the next step, and somehow things would not end up working out. And so eventually we figured out that this was a fundamental problem and we weren't going to be able to get around it. And the reason for this is that we could actually prove an impossibility result that said that if you had any predicate that was not semilinear, there was going to be some computation um, in which this predicate was not computed correctly by a population protocol. All right, and the proof of this, the intuition is, is more or less what I said. The actual proof involves pumping lemma style construction uh, using some uh, tricky uh, theorems from partial order theory, but uh, this was the result that we got at the end here. So, in some sense, by 2006, the population protocol model was dead. We knew exactly what it could do and exactly what it couldn't do, and so without further changes to the model, there wasn't anything else that we could say about it. And obviously, you know, we're all researchers, we don't like writing the last paper about anything, so there's quite a bit of work uh, uh, sort of concurrent in following this that said, well, maybe we should make some changes to the model and see what happens. All right, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of various approaches that people tried, you know, some of which are still ongoing, but most of which turned out to be a little bit of a dead end, maybe, I don't know, but it's kind of rude to accuse anybody of running down a dead end, I suppose. But uh, these are various things that we've tried, various extensions to the model that may be relevant in some circumstances, but in many cases didn't catch on so much, I think because they don't fit in very well with the story of doing molecular computation. All right, so the first option, are, are we on the option one slide option now? One. Option one. I'm sorry, I, I should have said next slide here. <laughs> yeah, so the first option, option one, add more structure. Um, so there have been a couple of attempts to do this where we take the basic model and then throw in some more information somewhere. Uh, the first one that I'm aware of is a paper by Rashid Garraway and Eric Rupert from 2007. Here the idea was uh, what they call a community protocol was we got rid of this total anonymity and individualism of the agents and we actually gave the agents identities or they gave the agents identities and to try to avoid having this blow up too much the identities were opaque and each agent could only remember a constant number of other agents and only agents they had directly interacted with uh, uh, or heard about indirectly from somebody else um, so this turned out to give the agents quite a bit of power. Uh, you could use these identities even with the restrictions as pointers, and this turns your population protocol into a, a pointer machine where you've got n agents, each of which can point to a constant number of ag other agents, and using some old results uh, from just theory of pointer machines, this actually means that you could use your population to simulate an n log n space Turing machine. And conversely, if you had an n log n space Turing machine where n is the size of the population, that was enough information to remember everything going on in the population protocol paper. So in this case, uh, we did end up stumbling backwards into a Turing machine again. And so you can completely characterize, at least to the extent that we know what Turing machines are capable of doing, what you can do in this model. A similar approach, uh, which in some ways was actually even more exciting in terms of how much information we were adding, was done by a paper by uh, Katsugianakis, uh, Mikhail and Spirakis a few years later. They called this what, a mediated population protocol. And the intuition here is we imagine that between each pair of agents, there is some connection that allows us to store persistent information. Um, I have to confess that I do not remember what the excuse was for doing this in the paper, but as a theoretical model, this is a very reasonable model. And uh, the only downside in some sense 
is that this very quickly turns into an n squared space Turing machine because you can store quite a bit of information on those edges and uh, there's enough structure in terms of the edges and, and being able to impose structure on top of the edges which these guys showed how to do that allows you to actually turn this into a full-blown n squared size uh, Turing machine tape and conversely if you have an n squared space Turing machine you can simulate this model so again we get an exact characterization of what's going on and a third uh, class of extensions which shows up in a lot of places it's kind of hard to point in specific places started this I have to cross my fingers here a little bit as I don't mostly just not remembering um, is that uh, you have a base station so in addition to all of the agents out there in the rest of the population there's a single agent that has essentially unbounded power and this was an assumption that was very common in the sensor network literature and as it migrated over into population protocols this produced a number of very nice results mostly about the question of how you get the base station to Simulate information quickly, but from a computability perspective, this is not so exciting because the base station can do whatever computation you want by itself. And as I said, one of the issues with all of these models is that they're a little bit tricky to justify in the context of molecular computation, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but since that's the direction which uh, a lot of the, the motivation for this model seemed to be going, I think that's why it didn't catch on so much. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Our second option, uh, which has been looked at in a bunch of cases, is to add oracles. So, as you may recall, one of the big issues that we had with trying to program population protocols is that we could not figure out when we had actually talked to all of the agents out there in the population, which prevents us from doing iteration, prevents us from doing sequential composition, and so forth. So, Mikhail and Spirakis proposed uh, a few years back that maybe we should just allow the protocol to do this. If we just have some sort of mechanism that allows a one of, say, a designated leader agent that is, is operating the protocol to tell when it has personally visited all of the other agents in the population, that uh, this cover time oracle, as they called it, would allow us to detect the presence or absence of specific nodes. And in particular, if we have a cover time node uh, oracle, we can do a zero test which means we can now use the population of agents out there who are not the leader uh, to represent counters just by counting values up in unary stored across the entire population of agents. And once we have the ability to do counters uh, where we can increment, decrement, and zero test on them, then we can turn that into a Turing machine, which now has log n space uh, capacity. And this is also true in the other direction, since the machine with this capacity can count up how many agents we have of each type and uh, run simulations of this cover time oracle population protocol. So I had a paper which generalized this a little bit in, in POTSI 2017, where I said, well, maybe instead of having this very specific oracle, we could do something where you have a clock bit that shows up on some of the agents. And the idea is that whenever the population stalls, whenever it gets stuck in some strongly connected component from which it can't escape, of configurations from which it can't escape, uh, eventually this clock bit will fire on one of the, or more of the agents in the protocol, allowing them to make further progress. And this turns out to be enough to implement a cover time oracle um, because you can detect when you're not going to be talking to anybody else that is going to change your current state. And uh, you can even use multiple layers of this to get essentially arbitrarily amounts of alternation in the complexity theory sense on top of what is basically log space, the log space representation of the, the number of agents in each particular state. And uh, so as far as I know, this only gets us up to NL but there's a possibility, which I was not able to figure out for myself, that if we could get unbounded alternation, we might actually be able to get a polynomial time computation out of this. I don't think that's likely, but that, that's still out there and it's still open. And finally, there's an early example of this. Uh, uh, Fisher and John had a uh, Oracle Omega question mark, which has actually shown up in a couple of papers since then, which was used to jumpstart leader election in a self-stabilizing version of a population protocol. And what this oracle would do is it would just tell you if there was no leader out there already, which would allow somebody to volunteer, or possibly more than one person to volunteer, to be a new leader. Um, a little bit more specialized, but also has the same, a little bit of the same flavor as these other things. So 
I think that these models are actually a little bit easier to justify in a molecular computation because you can imagine some experimenter sitting next to the test tube that after a while taps on the side of the test tube, nothing that seems to be making progress. But uh, it's not something that quite fit in with the basic model so much. So again, I, you know, these are things that, well, I think they're interesting directions to explore, uh, don't seem to have really affected the mainstream of population protocol research that much. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So here's the third option, and this is the one that everybody seems to have settled on, which is to take away the assumption of adversarial scheduling. All right, so I'm redoing my very first slide, or my second slide here, and I've crossed out that our scheduling is uh, uh, chosen by an adversary subject to a fairness condition, and now I want to instead assume that we're just scheduling uniformly at random. And so this is a very natural assumption for molecular computation. In fact, it's the standard assumption that's done in chemical reaction networks. And my understanding, I'm not a chemist, so I can't really say this with much authority, is that this might even be a reasonably accurate assumption as long as you're dealing with gas phase computations. And it's you know, maybe a little bit less accurate in a liquid computation because of how mixing works and so forth. But if you have a really good blender, you know, maybe it's reasonably close to a good approximation here. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So random scheduling gives time. So this is actually a model that we had in the original paper. Um, although technically we did not call this the population protocol model, in the POTSI 2004 paper we described what we called two models, one of which had adversarial scheduling and that was population protocols. The other one had randomized scheduling and that was conjugating automata. Um, this split was a little bit of a uh, result of, of a political issue of what we were going to name the model. And uh, in the long run, it seems that the alliteration wins out over uh, all other considerations. And so nowadays, people call this model population protocols, even though we had this different name earlier. Um, the nice thing about this random scheduling population protocol model is it's going to give us you know, more interesting computations than we got with adversarial scheduling later, but if at the very beginning, one of the things that immediately gives us is a notion of time. So when we were looking at adversarial scheduling, um, aside perhaps from the clock model where we have these clock ticks coming in, we don't really have any notion of time because the only guarantee we have on the adversary's behavior is an eventuality guarantee. So we know that after a few million years, the adversary will allow our, our protocol to make progress, but we don't actually have any bound on how much time that's going to take. Here we have a very natural notion of time since uh, we have these uh, steps happening one after the other. And there's no way for the adversary, since the adversary is basically gone at this point, we're just picking agents out of the, out of the population at random, there's no way for an adversary to delay things. So we can just count the number of steps that it takes or count the number of steps that it takes on average in order to achieve some objective. So for example, for the leader election protocol that we keep, I keep coming back to here, um, this is a protocol that will converge to a single leader in approximately n squared interactions. All right, so we got a, one of these sort of harmonic-like sums similar to coupon collector here. It's a little bit different because it's the, the one over k times n to the minus k thing. And uh, if you do n squared on interactions on average, you'll get down to a single leader. And in fact, most of the time that this protocol takes consists of the last two leaders floating around in this very large population trying to encounter each other. And some of the work that people do in this, uh, in this price model, they will quote, uh, number of interactions, but it's more common these days for people to quote parallel time, which is exactly the same thing. It's just that we divide by n first. And there are two justifications for this, one of which is that a lot of these protocols end up taking something like n log n or n log log n or what have you interactions. And so dividing out the n makes the, the differences between protocols more visible. All right, that's kind of the, the advertising motivation. Uh, the practical motivation or the this kind of real world motivation is that particularly in the context of something like chemical reaction networks, it's very natural to assume that these reactions are going on at a constant rate and that as we increase the size of the population, we're also going to increase the reaction rate because there are going to be more opportunities to do this. And when you divide out by the size of the population, you get this notion of parallel time, which is just interactions divided by n. All right, next slide, please. Okay. 
All right. So um, the big payoff, though, for moving over to randomized scheduling is that it's going to give us more power because we can now, if we have, for example, a leader, the leader can now wait, assuming that it has some ability to count off time, long enough to find the last missing agent that's looking for. So these things that we had to do previously with things like a cover time oracle, we can now do just by taking advantage of the randomness and predictability in some sense of the scheduling. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about computing with random scheduling. So I'm going to start by describing the original version that we had in the POTSI 2004 paper. Again, our, our basic picture here is that we're implementing a counter machine. So we have a leader somewhere that's acting as the finite state controller for this counter machine. And the values of the registers, of the counters are just expressed in unary as a bunch of tokens scattered across the population. And the, the one thing that's missing from the, the base model that we need to be able to implement to make this work is the ability to detect when a counter becomes zero. So the trick that we did in this paper is that when we elect a leader, the leader will appoint a deputy. So just pick some other agent and mark that agent specially. And now the deputy acts as a clock. You know, every one over n steps on average, the leader is going to meet the deputy. And if the leader wants to count off a long period of time or count off a you know, short period of time with high probability, what the leader can do is just wait to see the deputy say five times in a row. So if I see the deputy five times in a row, I'm the leader. Um, I know that I probably interacted with about end of the fifth people before that happens on average. I could get very unlucky and see the deputy five times in a row very quickly, but that is a low probability event. So as long as I'm willing to accept a, a polynomially small probability of error, I can now do things like zero tests by going and looking at everybody I meet, waiting to see if I have somebody who's carrying a blue token or what have you. And I can terminate that test by this test of seeing the deputy k times in a row. All right. And once I have the ability to do zero tests, I can build a counter machine, which gives me a, a very slow implementation of a log n space Turing machine. All right, next slide, please. Yes. Um, so we had a paper a few years after this that, that sped this up a little bit. And some of the ideas that showed up in this paper have later been used in the context of a lot of population protocols, uh, particularly the notion of using epidemics as both of them for transmitting information around through the population and it turns out as a mechanism for implementing a clock. So in this paper, uh, which appeared in this 2006, we assumed that we had an initial leader. All right, and this, this assumption turns out to be a very strong assumption, and, but at the time we couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. And again, we're going to store values in the agents uh, in unary. So in the picture of the test tube here, I have a, a large A counter in blue and a fairly large B counter in green and a smaller C counter in red. And in order to talk to these agents and execute operations on these counters, or more generally registers, since we allow more complicated operations than just increment and decrement, um, the leader is going to transmit epidemics through the populations. The epidemic is just a protocol where the leader issues an instruction, tells it to whoever they meet, and any agent that is carrying around this instruction will pass. guarantee that later epidemics overwrite previous ones. But um, the idea here is hopefully this will propagate information through the population more quickly than if the leader is just trying to talk to everybody by itself. And then we also are going to need a mechanism, which I'll describe in a little bit, called a phase clock, which allows the leader to detect when each of these phases of sending information out and possibly conducting, collecting information back is finished. Next slide, please. Okay, and what's going to make this all work is that we actually have a fairly good understanding, uh, at the time, unfortunately, only a theoretical understanding, now a little bit more practical, of the exponential behavior of epidemics. And so here we're looking at just a very simple process where an infected agent uh, infects everybody that they meet. And what we know about epidemics is that they pretty much always, almost always follow this uh, logistic curve or S-curve uh, behavior. 
where uh, we start with a single infected agent and then there's a period of exponential growth in the number of infected agents. And this kind of transitions over to a period of exponential decline in the number of uninfected agents. And we can use uh, known uh, concentration bounds for coupon collector. There are other ways of doing this, but this is what we used in the in the this 2006 paper to get fairly tight bounds on how long each of these steps take. So every stage of this epidemic process, we've got pretty good concentration bounds on the time for it to occur to get up to say a polynomial fraction of the agents being infected or to get to all of them being infected. And we can then use these tight concentration bounds to argue that almost anything that we're doing with an epidemic is going to take n log n interactions times some constant with high probability or in terms of parallel time, since we're dividing by n, log n parallel time. All right, next slide, please. So basic instruction cycle of our machine is that the leader decides it's going to carry out some operation, say it's adding two values together or something like that. And it's going to propagate that information outward by sending out an epidemic that's tagged with uh, the current round. And the rounds will wrap around after a constant number of rounds so that we don't have to keep increasing our state in order to avoid that. And then the followers will do whatever it is that they need to do to carry out this operation. And we showed that you could do things like um, set a register to zero or do addition and do more complicated operations by, by doing more complicated local protocols. And um, in some cases, if we needed to get information back to the leader, like for example, if the leader wanted to test to see if there were any agents that had, say, a blue token or not, we could also do that using an epidemic by having, say, an agent that has a blue token just start some counter epidemic that then propagates through the population and eventually gets back to the leader. And the only thing tricky here is that in order to make all of this work, the leader has to be careful to make sure that it doesn't start a new clock cycle, doesn't start a new instruction cycle before the previous one is finished. For that one, we need a phase clock, which I'm going to describe on the next slide, uh, which hopefully we have up now here. And so for the phase clock, we're again just going to use epidemics as now a timing mechanism. And the particular phase clock that we use, which was uh, turned out to be the first of many phase clock in the population protocol literature, is we have all of the agents are going to keep track of some phase that each agent is personally in, that is in some range of zero up to some modulus m minus one. And these phases propagate epidemic style. So if I meet somebody that is further ahead than I am to find an appropriate way considering that we're wrapping around, I'm going to jump up to whatever phase that they're in. And this means that most of the time, most of the agents are going to be in the same phase. They don't really have to all be in the same phase because we only really care about what phase the leader's in. But this will keep us from having stragglers that lag behind and cause trouble because they get pulled up to the current phase quickly. And what the leader is going to do to advance the phase clock is the leader is going to adopt the rule that if it sees another agent in its own phase, it will advance to the next phase. And this turns out to take about log n time uh, between phases on average because in order for the leader to see somebody in its own phase, that phase has to have propagated through this gossip the epidemic mechanism to a lot of other agents. And we know that in order for that to happen, in order to propagate something to a lot of other agents, that's something that takes log in time with high probability. Now, this isn't the only way for the leader to see another agent in its current phase. It could just get very lucky and meet somebody that just talked to, um, you know, sort of a situation where you're a hipster and you can meet somebody else to put on a different color hat and then you see them the very next day and now you realize everybody's doing it. But uh, that's not going to happen very often. And if we have enough phases running around in this phase clock, those rare unlucky events will go and cause the phase clock to fail. And in fact, we showed that for a suitable choice of M as a constant, you could guarantee that this thing worked for a polynomial amount of time with at least polynomial probability. All right, uh, let's do, uh, so let's do the next slide. I'm just, this is just a picture of the phase clock in action. I'm gonna skip over this fairly quickly to the slide after that. Uh, phase clock in action, state zero and four. Uh, this is just a simulation result that's showing that if we do this with eight phases and I think a thousand agents, we don't get any overlap between the phases on opposite sides of the clock. So this thing in fact works, but um, it's not very exciting. Let's move on to the next slide after that. Okay, the payoff. Payoff from random scheduling. Yes, thank you. 
Okay, so what did we get here before we could only do semi-linear predicates with adversarial scheduling? Now we can build a log space register machine with this overhead of polylog time per step. And more generally, what we now have is we're now in a situation where if we want to program a population protocol, this becomes an exercise in engineering stochastic. Building complicated stochastic processes, and you can somehow build those out of these pairwise interacting agents, then that's likely to give you some new way of doing computation in a population protocol. Next slide. And, <coughs> sorry. So, in particular, this opens up the possibility of doing fast parallel computation. All right. And an example of a very simple protocol that allows us to compute something very quickly in parallel without having this bottleneck of a leader in epidemics is uh, a protocol that now usually goes by the name of third state dynamics. Uh, we called it approximate majority in uh, 2007. Third state dynamics I think, comes from this other paper that invented essentially the same protocol from Infocom 2009. Uh, it's been rediscovered a couple of Yvo, can you hear me? Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, I'll text him. Or... No, it dropped. It was unstable. Well, it usually comes back. It, uh, let me try texting him. It wasn't sure whether this was his mobile or my own local connection because my connection told me a couple of times it's slow. And it was going well. I mean, it yeah. was. It was a great talk and it was going all right. Let's see if he can get my text. I'm going to use uh, one minute here just to ask the speakers of the next session to contact me via Zulip because the private chat is not working in this call. So some of you have done already, but if you didn't see my message, please just send your name, title of your talk on Zulip as a private message so that I have the names of everybody and, you know, I contact everybody. So it looks like he's still connected. Are you back? Hello, am I connected again? Oh, yes, no. yes, all right. No, yes. I think I was okay, ha having a problem with my cable here. I was afraid that uh, perhaps the connection had dropped, but I, I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's just an issue with my headset. So you can all hear me now. Yes, and yes. we're on fast parallel computation. Yeah, so we're on fast parallel computation, and uh, so I think I was describing this third state dynamics protocol. And so the idea here is that we have cancellation between the red and blue agents, but when we have cancellation, what happens is one of them becomes a blank agent. And this is a symmetric operation that's equally likely to remove red or blue agents from the population since it's just a function of which one comes first in that interaction. But the other side of the protocol is that if a blank agent meets a red or a blue agent, it adopts the color of whatever agent it meets. It meets. And uh, that's asymmetric. That's not a symmetric operation because you're more likely to meet somebody who already has the majority value since there's more of those people to meet. And so the nice thing about this is this is going to drive us toward the majority value. And in fact, uh, both of these groups showed that starting from any initial configuration, let's do the next slide for this, uh, starting from any initial configuration. So this slide is just doing a simulation of uh, starting out with an equal number of uh, Um, starting from any initial configuration, if you do n log n interactions or log n, wait for log n time, this being, again, our definition of time, then with high probability, we're going to end up with uh, a uniform state, a uniform configuration where everybody's red or everybody's blue. And in fact, we can also show that if you have a sufficiently large initial gap, 
then that uniform final configuration is going to be equal to the initial majority with high probability. And we had a slightly larger gap in these earlier papers, but uh, the current best uh, value that we have for the gap is anything that's omega root n log n, which was proved by Condon et al. a few years back, will give us the correct answer at the end with high probability. All right. Um, next slide, please. And the thing that turns out to be kind of cool about this algorithm is that there's a sense in which none of us actually invented it. Uh, there's a paper by Luca Cardinelli and uh, Attila uh, Sikasnagi in 2012 where they were looking at, well, honest to God, biomolecular computation by uh, eukaryotes. And apparently, and I, I don't really know enough biology to be able to talk about this too much, there is a structure that shows up in all eukaryotic cells. So all, pretty much all organisms on the planet that are not bacteria uh, have this thing called the cell cycle switch. And if you switch at it in just the right way, you can actually pull this third state dynamics algorithm out of it as a way of, of amplifying signals and effectively computing approximate majority inside cells. So this is an example of an algorithm that's 2.7 seven billion years old. And uh, I understand that on Monday's keynote speech, there was some discussion of whether uh, distributed algorithms that we study in these theoretical models are applicable to real life. Well, uh, I think you can't get much closer to real life than this. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. So I just want to do a quick recap here. So, so far we decided to get rid of this idea of adversarial scheduling because it's too weak and move over to random scheduling. And we get a lot of things out of this, uh, mostly the ability to do uh, you know, simulation of Turing machines. We get a lot of power. We can also do uh, a few uh, parallel algorithms. Um, the problem that we have is that with these is that, uh, in particular, we, we have this problem that for the Turing machine simulation, we needed to assume an initial leader, which is kind of annoying. Uh, the approximate majority only gives you an approximate value. And so there's still a lot of questions about whether or not we could build things that are faster or that don't assume an initial leader, give us more accurate values. All right, next slide. So there's an obstacle to doing this. And the big obstacle to doing this, or the big obstacle to come up with more exciting population protocols, uh, turns out to be the assumption of finite state agents. And we know this because of two very uh, frightening papers that appeared in DISC uh, about you know, five and, I guess, six years ago. And the first of these, uh, speed faults in computation by chemical reaction networks, is actually, uh, for the stronger model of chemical reaction networks, um, showed that if you assume that you have a population in which all of the initial states are initially dense, so either um, a particular state is not present in the population at all, or if it is, it's present in a constant fraction of the agents, then it's possible to show just by looking at um, the fact that, that there's only sort of constant sized trees of interactions that produce each particular state that you could ever possibly reach, that all of the reachable states, all of the states that could be generated by your protocol, are going to be generated. They're even going to be generated densely in a constant fraction of the agents, and they're going to be generated in a constant amount of time. So you know, a linear number of interactions very early on in the execution of the protocol. What this means is that this problem that we had before in an adversarial context of not being able to detect termination just came back in a randomized context. Because if you have any state that consists of some agent sticking its hand up and saying, I have now completed the protocol, and the answer to the protocol is X, and if you have some other possibly reachable state where the agent sticks their hand up and says, I've completed the protocol, and the answer is Y, um, then if you started an initial configuration from which both of those states could in principle be generated, and for most of these protocols that is in fact the case because there might be some agent out there that you haven't talked to yet which might change what the output of the protocol is, then in fact in, the, in a constant amount of time, very quickly in the interaction of the protocol, you're going to have a huge army of agents sticking their hands up uh, saying we have finished the protocol and the answer is X or the answer is Y, and that's going to be useless if we want to then use that to trigger some later stage for the protocol. The second result, uh, was in some ways even more annoying from my point of view because it were mission protocols with a leader paper. Um, this showed that if you wanted to do leader election, and there, there's a, 
A uh, little bit of an asterisk here with this word stable leader election. If you want to do leader election, you want to guarantee that you don't end up in the state by accident where there are no leaders, no possibility of constructing a leader, uh, then that is something you're going to have to do very carefully. In fact, the fastest that you can do this is just by doing the cancellation algorithm that we had to begin with. And so uh, these guys, uh, David Doty and David Solovitchik, showed that if you tried to do any other kind of algorithm for leader election or anything that ran faster, there was always a possibility that you deleted your last leader by accident and ended up with a protocol that can make no further progress. Okay, and in both of these cases, these tell us that we're in trouble if we're going to start in a dense configuration, which is a fairly natural assumption if we're just imagining pouring a bunch of chemicals into the test tube. So, next slide, please. Um, we can respond to this the same way we respond to all the other problems with this model, is we'll adjust the model. So, on this one, again, it's the same picture one more time. Now, I've crossed out finite state and add small states. So instead of assuming that our agents have a constant number of states, let's imagine that the number of states grows with the population. Ideally not too fast, maybe logarithmic or polylogarithmic, or in some cases even log log n. Um, and hopefully this will allow us, again with random scheduling, to now do more interesting forms of computation. Next slide. Um, so. Using larger states was uh, first proposed, to my knowledge, in the context of adversarial scheduling. There's a paper by uh, Katsuki Nakas et al. Um, and in that context, it actually gives you noticeably more power. So uh, in this paper, it was shown that if you have significantly less than log log n states, you're still kind of stuck with the, uh, the semi-linear predicates. But at log log n states, you hit this threshold where suddenly there are new predicates that you can compute that are no longer semi-linear. And if you go all the way up to log n states, which is not very many states, it's still only log log n bits, um, then you can actually simulate non-deterministic log space Turing machines. And if you go further up, as you add more and more states, there are more and more things that you can do. So they have a hierarchy theorem similar to the space hierarchy theorem for classical Turing machines that says that as you add more states, then there's always strictly uh, all strict increase, assuming you're adding up new states, in the set of predicates that you can compute. And um, this particular work was looking at adversarial scheduling, but there's been a lot of work since then that looked at adding more states in the context of randomized scheduling. And I think removing just this one particular result has been, or particular constraint has been the reason why we've had such a large wave of uh, population protocol results in the last couple of years. All right, next slide, please. So to give an example of some of these results, I'm not going to be able to do everything, so I'm going to try not to be too egotistical here, but some of this is going to be a little bit egocentric. Uh, one of the things that we get very quickly if we have more states is now it becomes a lot easier to build a phase clock, and, and in particular, it also to do leader election than when we had a constant number of states. So. Dan Alistair and Rati Gelshvili and I had a paper from uh, SOTA 2018 where we showed that you could build a phase clock with no leader at all if you had log n states and if you also knew a bound on log n. And so the trick that we used was we just uh, imported an idea from the low balancing literature, this power of two choices idea that Michael Mitzemacher had back in his dissertation, uh, where if you want to get an even distribution of balls into bins, when you throw a ball into your bins, you, you pick two bins. The uh, population protocol model means you're picking two agents. And then you throw the ball into the lighter weight bin. All right. Or in the context of a population protocol, we may have two agents meet, and whoever has a smaller value increments their value by one. And the nice thing about this from the point of view of keeping track of time is that this is a clock that advances at a very steady rate because we're adding exactly one to the total value across the entire population with each iteration. So we're exactly adding uh, exactly one to the average value every n steps. And we can use results from the load balancing literature to argue that uh, the largest value and the smallest value that we get are always going to be within log n of each other. And so if we know what log n is, we can wrap around after log n and keep everything down to log n states. Um, there's been several other phase clocks, which are a little bit harder to describe, that get even better performance. Uh, there's a series of papers by Gus Nietzsche and then Gus Nietzsche and Iznansky, and then 
which showed that if you took the leader-based phase clock and replaced the single leader with a junta, a polynomially sized collection of leaders, you could elect that junta fairly quickly. And if you were very careful in how you tuned everything, you could then use that junta to kind of be the, the, the pile of agents slowing down a phase clock, which you could then use to elect another leader, a uh, single leader on top of this. And uh, finally, there's a more another paper by Kosky uh, and Usnansky, which manages to get the cost of doing this on a constant time, although you give up the stable leader election pro pro uh, uh, stable, uh, stable leader election uh, condition, and this is how they get around the, the Dodi Solovitchik lower, lower bound. All right, next slide. Okay, you um, thank you. So, so many of these results uh, assume that you have knowledge of n. Another question you can ask is what if you don't have knowledge of n? Uh, the first answer to this is a paper by Dodi et al. from uh, this 2008, which would compute n exactly with high probability in a very short amount of time, log n, log, log n time. So the reason I find this impressive is the population protocols can't do anything in less than log n time, because log n time is the minimum amount of time for every agent to interact at least once. So if you're counting everybody, you have to wait at least log n time before you even have the chance to notice that the last person exists. So these guys managed to do this in just a little bit more than that. Uh, the only cost was that this now requires a very large number of states, end of the 60th. Uh, it sounds better if you express it in bits. Uh, it becomes just order of log n. Uh, but most of the, the convention that we've been using is that we express things in number of states. And there's been some work following this, which I'm not going to get into too much here, uh, which improves on this dramatically, either by allowing you to greatly reduce the number of states and maybe increase the time a little bit, or greatly reduce both the time, the or slightly reduce the time and greatly reduce the number of states, but not as much. Um, in these cases, we're mostly looking at getting an estimate of log n, which allows you to have smaller states just because you don't have to have n states just to store the answer. All right, next slide, please. Um, so this leads us to what I'm going to claim is the current model for population protocols, or you know, possibly the dominant current model for population protocols as of 2020. So we got rid of the finite state assumptions, and now we're looking at a collection of small state agents. Uh, we still have this notion of pairwise interaction as our fundamental method of communication. And we also got rid of the assumption of adversarial scheduling, so we're mostly now looking at uh, interactions chosen uniformly at random. And additionally, because of the existence of these very leader election protocols, if you need to assume that you have a leader or need to assume that you have accurate counts of the number of agents, this is something that you could do um, as part of programming your protocol. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so. The obvious question then is, given how much we've been changing this model around, what is the actual population protocol model? What is sitting at the middle of it that justifies claiming that all these different variants are really the same model? And so the claim that I want to make is that uh, the, really, the real defining property of this model is that we don't have any kind of communication structure. So unlike standard uh, message passing or uh, shared memory or even uh, graph-based models like local or congest, um, there's really nothing going on here uh, that allows agents to know who they're talking to or who they've talked to before or who they might talk to again. And we have no kind of structure to work with, and somehow we still need to do computation anyway. All right. And having gotten to this point, the obvious question to ask next is, you know, what else could, might we want to change in the future? And I think that the interesting question is going to be uh, possibly for the, the next stage of work on this is to ask what happens if we suddenly come in and allow things like agent IDs and large states, even though we were very allergic to these earlier and tried very hard to avoid this. Next state, please. All right. So what we were afraid of when we defined population protocols as having very small states was a Turing machine. And so now I want to say, well, you know, I give up. Maybe it's okay to build a Turing machine. Um, if we want to build a Turing machine, we know that we can do it fairly quickly. You know, if we have an epidemic, so the phase clock and so forth, we can run everything in log end time for Turing machine step because we can just have the leader who's simulating the finite state controller broadcast an announcement saying, I would like the value of cell four for this example, I guess. And then we can have whoever's carrying around cell four send back that value and we can do an entire step of the Turing machine in roughly log n time with high probability. 
And this is a little bit embarrassing, though. Embarrassingly parallel model, you know, something where we've got 10 to the 30th molecules floating around in a test tube or something, and we're turning it into a very sequential model where we're executing a clock tick every, I think, in real molecules, we're probably talking every couple of minutes. And this is not very nice because what we really like to do is we really like to be able to exploit the parallelism that we've got out there to actually do computations in parallel. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. And we can't get too carried away when we do this, uh, adding states, because having identities you know, might be nice because it allows us to represent input tape cells. But if we allow unbounded states, if we allow arbitrarily large states in our population, then there's a trivial way to implement arbitrary uh, computations in just log n time, which is we can just have each of the input agents broadcast their state, their, you know, which index they are, have on the tape and what value they have. Uh, through the entire population using an epidemic. And with no limitation on state size, there's no limitation that prevents us from having n of these epidemics all propagating in parallel so that every agent learns the entire input and can compute the output all by itself. All right, so once we have this very large state space, um, everything that you want to do, you can do in log n time. And so in that sense, this uh, large state space model uh, ceases to be interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, the natural fix, I think, here is to say, well, let's suppose that we're limited to polynomial time states. And now we have what I think is a fairly interesting model, which I actually don't know much about what this can compute, which is one where we essentially can think of this as a variant of a standard polynomial size circuit model for parallel computation. So if we look at uh, the usual model, the complexity theorists use for parallel computation, they're often looking which is where we have a circuit that consists of a polynomial number of gates, which we can imagine these gates are being implemented just by agents combining values together. And this polynomial number of gates are arranged in analog or polylog uh, number of layers, which gives us a measure of time because the depth of the computation, the amount of agents that a value would need to propagate through before we generate an output. And then the class NC is just all the predicates that we can compute using these polynomially many agents and uh, with polylog depth in some sort of structured circuit. And the important word there in that definition is structured. We have the ability to very carefully place wires between particular gates in the circuit, or in the context of a population protocol, we would have the ability to very carefully determine the exact schedule of who interacts with whom at each step, uh, allowing us to collect values in a very specific way. And the problem is that with randomized scheduling, um, we don't have this ability. Instead, what we end up with is essentially a random circuit where we still have this kind of, we can sort of imagine that we have this layer structure just representing you know, the, the propagation of values forward in time. We still have a polynomial size bound on the number of gates because this just represents the different agents running around carrying values with them. Um, we have a little bit of additional power because we can probably, the values bound are tagged in some way because we have large enough state to at least do that. Um, but then the question is, having gone and put our circuit in a blender, is there some way that we can use the slight bit of additional power in order to get back the original results? And perhaps is there some way that we could take an arbitrary po uh, parallel computation and turn it into a parallel computation by a large state population protocol? Or conversely, is there that uh, no matter how clever we are, there are going to be some things that we can do in parallel when we have structure that we can't do in parallel when we don't have structure. All right. So I'm actually going to call this done here. Uh, there's one extra slide, but I, I was mostly saving that if I got a very particular question. So um, I'm willing to open up to questions now. Ah, okay. I was about to show you the uh, very last slide, <laughs> but then I was hiding it again, okay? Um, Hello? Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, but... Uh... Yes, it's my internet connection is apparently not the best one here. Uh, so okay, okay, I can hear you now. you wish you had designed differently back in 2004? <laughs> that would be my initial question. I'll give you the floor to talk straight about this, yeah. I, I think I missed most of that, I'm sorry. Okay. What, 
your last slide. Uh, Actually All right, I will talk about my last slide. Okay. All right, so 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 this last slide, yeah, I couldn't fit it, find a really good place in the talk itself to fit this in. But let me talk about this just as kind of a code at the end here. There are two things that I wish that we had defined differently back in 2004, because in retrospect, I think we got the definition wrong. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing that we got the definition wrong in some sense because you know all definitions are legitimate and there's been actually some nice work that came out as a result of defining things in this particular way. But the two things that we change, one of them is a very technical condition regarding uh, how we decide that a population protocol has finished. And in the 2004 paper, we said that we were interested in stable computations, meaning where a computation stably computed something if we eventually reached a configuration where everybody had the correct output. And, and under no circumstances and no possible continuation of that execution could we ever reach a configuration where somebody had an incorrect output. So this was a way of trying to get at convergence, where we eventually reach a configuration where everybody has the correct output, and it just happens to be the case that in the continuation of the execution that we go through, uh, everybody continues to have the correct output. When we have adversarial scheduling, these two notions of stabilization and, and convergence are equivalent because an act always send us on a bad path if it exists of uh, convincing somebody to give up their good output and replace it with a bad output. With randomized scheduling, there's actually a difference between these two because in a randomized uh, population protocol computation, it may be that I very quickly converge to a configuration where everybody has the correct output, but there's a little bit of noise kind of still hanging out in the protocol somewhere it's a long time to get rid of that prevents us from actually having that correct output be permanently did. Even though in any typical execution, we're never going to deviate from that correct output. And so this leads to, um, you know, some worries about, well, maybe I built a protocol that converges to the right answer, but does it actually stabilize? And so there's a lot of going back and forth in, in some of the recent work on population protocols that worries about that distinction. Um, had we gone and just defined everything in terms of convergence to begin with, uh, then on the one hand, we might not have had to do all of that work. On the other hand, there's all this beautiful work that uh, we wouldn't have seen. So, But I, I think that the right definition going forward is probably to think about uh, convergence is what we're aiming for and not worry about uh, these rare events where having converged to the right answer then you, you somehow undo that because some low probability event happens. Okay, so the, the second thing that I wish we had done differently is that for at least a randomized version of the model, it seems to me that it makes sense to allow the processes to, or the agents to flip coins. And this is something you get for free in chemical reaction networks, because in a chemical reaction network, there's nothing that prevents you from having a pair of molecules where if they interact with each other one way, they produce one set of outputs, and if they interact with each other in a slightly different way, they produce a different set of outputs. And if you tune the rates at which these different events occurs, you can effectively build coins so that whenever you do a transition, you can get a coin flip out of it as kind of a bonus. We get this a little bit in a randomized uh, scheduling model because the scheduling is random. So you can look, for example, at who gets to be first and who gets to be second in the transition relation. That effectively gives you a coin flip. But if you're using that for other purposes, getting honest to God coin flips out of uh, the random scheduling and extracting randomness that is not in some way correlated with something else that's going on turns out to be fairly difficult. Um, we have examples in the literature of synthetic coins that do this in kind of an imperfect way. Um, it may even be possible to simulate uh, randomized computations perfectly. I know that we can do it if we were willing to wait a long time and run everything through a leader. I don't know what happens if we're trying to do a parallel protocol. But uh, it seems to me that if we're allowing randomness uh, to be something that's out there in the scheduling, it might make sense to allow randomness to be something built into the model as well. All right. Okay. But uh, that's just my peevish views on, on these things. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from Dr. Michael. Hi, Jim. Oh, okay. Can hi, you hear hi. me? Congratulations yes, yes. For, the great, for the great paper and the award, and also for the very nice talk, despite the difficulties. All right, thank you. Uh, so my first question, I have two, I think. 
is about the thing that you said. I see that you put a lot of emphasis on the relation of information protocols and chemical reaction networks. Uh, the yeah. way I see it sometimes, and some other people see it, is the fact that it seems that we have in population protocols some unpredictable interaction pattern. In this case, it is a click. Most of the time. But we also have some other papers coming from other areas, let's say, sub areas, uh, that explore other types of interactions, of dynamic interactions, like worst case interactions mm -hmm. and so on, which are typically controlled by ad adversary scheduler and can be represented to some extent by a dynamic network. So we have in one extreme population protocols which are unstructured and sort of a click, and we have other models which are more structured, but again dynamic and unpredictable. Uh, do you believe that it would be worthwhile studying what is between the two, like other scheduling assumptions? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I kind of wish I'd spent a little bit more time on, or, or some time on, was talking about uh, there. You know, there's clearly going to be a connection between population protocols and other models that have this sort of clique-like structure, like congested clique or things like that. And I think that there's a lot of room um, for any number of models of, of that sort to look at what happens as you kind of tune this parameter of how much structure I've got and how much control I have over scheduling exactly as you said. So, so yeah, I, I agree that, you know, in this talk I was emphasizing chemical reaction networks a lot because I think that that's a good motivation for the, the random scheduling models. Uh, but even with random scheduling, it may make sense to look at these more structured models and how they relate to the basic model as well. I don't want to dismiss that work in any way. Thanks. Uh, can I have my second question, please? Uh, hold on a second. I have a question by and you can have your second question, okay? Okay, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to uh, ask something, I guess, about your last slide with uh, stable computation and, like, I guess, the restriction this puts on, uh, where all of the nice time lower bounds that exist are all lower bounds on reaching a stable configuration. Uh, so I guess, like, if, if people on the whole just sort of agree that, okay, stability is too strong of an assumption and we should just focus on convergence, like, what do you think the true results would be? Like, how much do you think the existing protocols are sort of limiting themselves by focusing on stability? Like, it seems like we can well, probably think... lead our election with a constant number of states, given the brief announcement result that you cited. Uh, but it's not like crystal clear that that actually works. So, yeah, I, I don't. There's a little bit of uncertainty about that particular result. Um, yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, we have this hard limit at some level that we can't do anything in less than log n time that depends on all of the inputs because that's the, the minimum time in order to talk to everybody. Um, it may be the case that, uh, at least for simple protocols, that everything's going to end up at the top of that log n boundary because that's the way a lot of these protocols for things like leader election and counting and so forth seem to be headed. But these are fairly simple protocols. So it may be that if we have something that's trying to do something more complicated, like one of these parallel computations that, that runs in super logarithmic time, that uh, you know, if we can't do it in, in, in logarithmic time in a model that has a lot of structure, we're not going to be able to do it in logarithmic time in a population protocol. Now, the problem we run into there is that we don't actually have any good lower bounds on parallel computation. Um, all we, you know, for all we know, once you get up to NC1 circuits, log depth circuits, you've actually gone all, all of P and possibly all of uh, the polynomial time hierarchy. So I think it's going to be a big ask for us to come up with lower bounds um, in population protocols that are stronger that are just using that. But it may be that there are some problems where, you know, we can still get some sort of lower bound for convergence, uh, but it is going to be more work than getting a lower bound for stabilization because, uh, you know, it does tend to break a lot of the techniques that we've got uh, for stabilizing computation lower bounds if, if we just ask for convergence instead. Okay, thank you. Um... Autumn, your very last question now. Yeah, sure. Uh, my second question is not a technical one. It is about the past tense of the device from your side. Looking back at when you started working on this paper, uh, I guess it was one of those cases where you feel you've got something radical and promising, or maybe fun to work on, but maybe not that mainstream, let's say, at that point. Uh, how do you make the choice of whether it is worth the effort exploring a new topic? what would be your advice to young researchers when they are facing that dilemma of whether to explore something uh, innovative and maybe risky? Well, you know, 
at some level, you know, we're trying to, you know, any paper, it's like buying a lottery ticket. You never know where it's going to go. And yeah, I, you know, when we wrote the population protocol paper, um, I was pretty convinced this was a one-off. Uh, our previous attempt at, at doing something in this area produced what eventually became a tech report on urn automata, which uh, nobody has ever heard of for good reasons. Uh, it's basically a population protocol with an input tape attached to it. And, you know, at some level, we never really expected this to take off in the way that it did. So I think that probably the advice that I would give is that if you are doing work, if you are a young researcher who's doing some work, and it looks like you can say something that somebody hasn't said before, you know, you should put it out there because if nothing else is going to move the conversation forward. And you never know if it will turn out to, to light a spark and turn out to be something that is interesting to a lot of people and will lead to a lot of follow-up work. But predicting that in advance is very difficult. And, and I don't think I have any better ability to do that than anybody else. And certainly if I were a young researcher, I would just have to at some level go with my instincts and say, yes, uh, you know, I have something that I think is interesting. I've worked on it for a while. Let's put it out there and see what happens. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Zee. Okay. I thank, I thank everybody for listening, but I thank uh, Jane very much and congratulate you for this excellent presentation. Here. And, uh, uh, particularly difficult uh, circumstances. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah, you. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but uh, to totally beyond you. <laughs> your influence. Yeah. Sadly, I'm too old to emigrate to a first world country. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that the good old phone system has worked reliably enough for us today. Um, that everybody else was on Zoom, sort of more or less, and uh, we'll continue this session then in the default Zoom room, uh, as latecomers are not in the ending up in the wrong room. So thanks again, Jane. I uh, hope that you're, you're connected again uh, properly uh, back home. And uh, so see you there in the other room. All right, thank you all. <laughs> all right. Thank you again. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Switch to the other. Stop sharing. Oh, I think I'm the host. So if the moment I click leave here, it actually end. It means that I'm gonna save the chat here. And I'm gonna get the recording. You will? Yeah, yeah. Feel free to close it. If it's okay, I'm closing it then. Okay, and it will save the chat to the file system, right? Yeah. Yes, it will. At least it, it did for me when I recorded it oh, automatically saved the chat. Record locally. Okay, oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. See you there. See you soon.